Good, good. <laughs> but I, I respond to G. Okay. <laughs> um, it's spoken at the AWRA this morning. I've been doing Yeah, so you don't know what, what, whether this would be good. Oh, I'm not <laughs> sure. <laughs> so, so this uh, uh, professor here is a Bursal Rice distinguished mentor. Distinguished so this is not a geology, a PSA hyper geology distinguished lecturer. This lectureship, we've had these lectures here before, but we're not all the fun. Thank you very much for this uh, kind introduction. And uh, uh, I really appreciate to, uh, the opportunity to speak here. And this is a, I, I gave talks in many places, but this is the first time I talk in a real museum. Yeah. And it's really nice. It's great. And so, as uh, Colin just said, that uh, this lecture is in uh, memory of Mr. Burso and Professor jo uh, Shirley Dreis. And I want to acknowledge GSA Hydrogeology Division for partially sponsor the uh, travel for um, my trip. And so um, I'm going to talk about today uh, wastewater injection or fluid injection induced seismicity. And so what I show here uh, a few scenarios of human activity that uh, may cause uh, earthquakes. Uh, we have heard a lot about fracking. And so fracking, injecting fluid into the subsurface creates small cracks and, and, then, uh, and then generate small earthquakes. And these earthquakes are typically pretty small and they do not normally uh, cause much damage on the surface or even uh, people even uh, not feel them. And then uh, this is a, the wastewater injection scenario where the wastewater is delivered to quite uh, deep in the subsurface. And uh, if, in particular, if there are faults nearby, and um, seismicity can occur uh, in this uh, deep wa water injection site. And then uh, moving to the right here, this is a fluid extraction site that could be oil, gas, or water. And large volume of fluid, when the large volume of fluid is extracted from the subsurface, and the stress regime may change around this extracted uh, volume and, and that could also uh, create a active faulting or seismicity. And then the other um, scenario here is the surface reservoir. Those are uh, relatively large reservoirs that I'm talking about. And so in particular, if these reservoirs are uh, filled up very quickly 
and that could also uh, change the stress under the surface and, um, and potentially cause earthquakes. And so what I'm going to focus today is uh, looking at wastewater injection induced seismicity. And so just one type that, uh, um, uh, one scenario. Uh, this is a photo that I took uh, in 2014, uh, June 4th. That's uh, uh, four days after a 3.2 earthquakes that occurred in northern Colorado near Greeley. And uh, after the earthquake, the geophysicist, uh, two graduate students at that time, Bill, Will, uh, Will and uh, Jenny, and they uh, were install a set of seismometers. And, um, um, and then uh, this is a, a, another graduate student who work, was working with me at the time. Uh, he's a hydrogeologist. And so the geophysicists were doing very serious work of installation and checking the data and calibrating things, and then the hydrogeologist is just jumping around, um, create, basic create perturbation to the system, and, and then see whether the geophysicists can figure out what's going on with the, the monitoring system. And so there's some uh, similarity to the uh, induced seismicity. Induced seismicity is really uh, the fluid goes into the subsurface, uh, disturb the natural equi uh, equilibrium state, and uh, um, potentially cause earthquakes. And so with that, uh, a few years ago, uh, when um, the uh, oil and gas activity is just uh, about to uh, take off, and, um, and we heard about uh, induced seismicity or seismicity from different places. And uh, so this is a map that shows some of the uh, uh, speculated or reported uh, induced seismicity um, in U.S. and several in Colorado and a lot of in Texas and Oklahoma, um, um, not too many um, in um, the central part of U.S. And at that time, one of the uh, really general questions we uh, were wondering was that why some, we know that there are a lot of injection wells, but why are only some places that have seismicity? Or why are some injection sites more prone to seismicity than others? And so it's a, a general question that we're curious. And we think that um, um, through looking um, at data and uh, perhaps modeling and, and an analysis of the data, we could understand uh, or uh, address this question. So that's the motivation um, when we started this project. And I just wanted to use a couple of slides that uh, look at just a little bit background about uh, wastewater uh, production. And so there are basically two types of, or two sources of wastewater that we're talking about. One is that uh, from fracking process, um, the frac well, fracking process inject fluid into the subsurface. But once the fracking job is done, the fluid, not the fl fluid, it come back. And so that's what we call flow back water from fracking that become wastewater. And the other wastewater source is that uh, during production, most, a lot of times that uh, what's extracted to the surface is a mixture of oil, gas, and water. And then on the surface, you separate oil and gas, and then uh, the leftover water become uh, what's called produced water. And so these two major sources of wastewater then uh, that needs to be uh, disposed. Um, there are various ways to deal with these wastewater. And one is use this wastewater as a way of enhanced oil recovery. That means inject this wastewater into the subsurface and push oil and gas through the formation and enhance the recovery of the oil gas uh, recovery. And then the other is just simply uh, inject them into deeper uh, formations and let them stay there or go somewhere. And so these are the two major uh, method that uh, deal with the uh, wastewater. Um, and so it put some numbers in the perspective for, in terms of the produced water in 2007 and also uh, estimate in 2012. And so U.S. produced about 20 billion barrels of produced water. And, uh, um, and so the estimate now, we don't have an exact number, but uh, some uh, very rough estimate, it's probably in the hundreds of billions of barrels. 
those. And, and so again, we don't have a specific number, so we'll take this estimate with a, a grain of salt. Um, and for uh, produced water, the, about 40% of these uh, water is disposed by uh, deep, uh, deep well injection. And so um, when we started the project, we um, decided to look at two data sets. One is the injection well data set, and then the other is the seismicity data set. And so this is a map that shows the um, injection well site from 34 states in uh, central eastern US. And so all these blue dots are, um, we plotted those dots on, on the basis of the data we collected over the uh, last few years. And so those data were from uh, open source and some mostly from the state, different states and uh, oil gas commissions or oil gas conservation commissions of, uh, of various uh, kind. And, uh, but it turns out that uh, the connecting of these data is, is a really non-trivial matter. And I had a great graduate student who worked on this day and night. And I was very smart in terms of um, writing programs and uh, grabbing data from various sources. They're very non-uniform. There's no spreadsheet some sitting there that uh, you can just go get it. Um, and some are PDFs, some are handwritten reports, and some are scanned in. Um, so it was a quite an uh, uh, adventure looking at this data set. Um, and then so among the, so there are 188,000 wells that uh, uh, we looked through. And uh, among these 188,000 wells, about uh, 100,000 wells were active at the time. Well, that's a couple of years ago, and I think it was still uh, pretty much the same. And, um, and so these injection wells come online, and, and then they sometimes after a few years they may stop, and then they uh, become abandoned. And so, so at the time, or roughly now, there are about 100,000 active. Among the 100,000 active wells, 27,000 is a salt uh, water disposal. Salt water disposal is the same as wastewater disposal, which uh, use these two terms interchangeably. Uh, these wastewater is uh, pretty salty. Uh, the concentration of salt varies, and um, uh, some can be as, as salty as 10 times of seawater. Um, but uh, uh, so there's um, lots of stuff in the wastewater. And, and then um, the other uh, about 79,000 wells are for enhanced oil recovery. And so these are the maps shows um, these two types of well distribution. And then we also look at the uh, seismicity data over the uh, time period of 1973 to 2015. And uh, I might want to mention that the injection well data, this is also, well this, the time period for all these wells is a little bit longer than uh, the period we specify here. Um, the injection well data goes back a little further. However, uh, before 1973, the number of injection wells or the uh, really large or active ones are um, not too many. And so we can consider these two data sets uh, pretty much over the same time period. And so these uh, white dots on this map shows uh, earthquake locations, all the earthquakes with magnitude greater than zero and that's from the uh, National Seismic uh, System Earthquake Catalog. And so the different sizes represent the magnitude. Um, and I will take a look at a little bit more later. And so the, uh, the first order question after we looked at these two data sets is, are these two data sets related and how they're related? And what kind of relationship that we may uh, derive from uh, looking at those. And so uh, we looked at the, the spatial and temporal criteria and, uh, of these data sets. And so the spatial criteria is that um, um, we look at the one earthquake within 15 kilometers of earthquake or of the injection well. So if the earthquake is within uh, 15 kilometers of the injection well, then we'll consider this earthquake is spatially associated with that well. And so that 15 kilometers radius coming from two notions here. One is that uh, the conventional wisdom is that uh, earthquakes often occurs within five kilometers radius of injection well. 
And then the other is that uh, uh, there's often uncertainty when we, uh, or when seismologists locate or relocate uh, epicenters. And so we uh, add these two uh, parameters and search a radius of 15 kilometers. And if within 15 kilometers, and we find an earthquake at the time of this uh, injection well that's injecting, then we'll consider that they are related. And so that's a spatial criteria. And the temporal criteria is that uh, if that well is injecting at the time of the earthquake, then temporally they are related. And so um, consider both spatial and temporal criteria. And then we identified <coughs> um, 18,757 wells among this, uh, um, from this background, uh, 188,000 uh, total wells. And so that's about 10% uh, of all the wells. And so the yellow dots are the wells that are associated with earthquakes, uh, are the wells that are associated with the earthquakes. And, uh, and then, uh, so this map overall shows the active and spatial temporary associated injection wells. So this is the injection well map. And, and the blue dots are all the uh, background of all the data we have. And so here in this uh, lower right corner, and shows what, how these wells are distributed in different states. And I'm just going to highlight uh, three states here, Oklahoma, Texas, and Kansas. About 85% of all these uh, um, associate wells are in these uh, three states. Um, there are other states that are coming up as well, but uh, um, that's probably not surprising, uh, because primarily because of the quite active oil gas production and exploration activities or development going on there. And so that's the uh, injection well data situation. And then uh, if we look at the, the earthquake or seismicity data, so earthquake through, uh, associated with injection through time. And so in the next few slides, I'll show you the uh, data uh, from different, uh, through, marching it through time. And so this is a uh, seismicity data. The white dots are all the earthquakes uh, greater than zero. And different sides, again, represent the different magnitude. The red ones are uh, identified as associated with injection. And so this is 1975. And in the, uh, this plot here that shows the number of earthquakes per year versus time. So here in 1975, the gray bars are all the uh, earthquakes from the catalog. The red uh, bars are the earthquakes that are associated with uh, injection. So we call them associated earthquakes. And so uh, 1980, 1985, 1990, 1995, 2000, and 2005. And, and so up until about 2005, uh, we see that uh, uh, the fluctuation is more or less uh, kind of natural variation uh, range, in the natural variation range. But it started in late uh, 2000s. And, and so we see increased seismicity uh, start to take up. So this is 19, uh, what, 2010, uh, 2012, uh, 2013, 2014, and 2015. Um, so here the vertical scale here is 200. And uh, in 2015, earthquakes did not stop at 2015. But um, the graduate student was about to graduate. So. The, the plot stopped, the earthquake didn't. Um, and then later on, we did uh, update this plot. And so here is a later plot that uh, we, we upgraded, uh, updated. And so it's just to recap the seismicity data, and in particular, looking at the earthquakes that are associated with injection activity over the period of 1973 to 2015. And so this is a map. Uh, the red are the associated earthquakes and this is the uh, histogram. And so the few things that we can see from here is that the uh, earthquakes that are not, or the background, uh, background earthquakes stayed about 10 to uh, 12, uh, 25 per year. Um, earthquakes that are associated with injection um, changed from a few in the 1970s to about maybe 10 in the early 2010, and then um, to greater than 650. And so I think it's uh, uh, almost close to 9, uh, 900 or 1,000. And so we, can, we conclude from this uh, two data set 
that uh, increases in uh, recent U.S. Uh, or re a recent increase in U.S. mid-continent seismicity is clearly associated with injection wells. And so again, we're uh, looking at the association, uh, but we're not specifically saying that uh, this caused that or injection caused seismicity. This is a pure data association. Um, and this is a, just another graph that I uh, borrowed from a USGS seismologist, um, uh, same seismicity data set, um, same map, same uh, again uh, data uh, point, and uh, uh, except that this plot plots the cumulative number of earthquakes greater than three since 1970, and then uh, this curve here shows again uh, cumulative uh, earthquakes. And so what uh, Andrea um, Nanos did is that, um, um, so you can see this almost like a hockey stick kind of um, pattern, uh, sharp increase from about uh, 2009. And so what she did is that you, uh, she moved uh, earthquakes from Oklahoma, and then you can see this cumulative curve kind of going back to a more natural uh, trend, and then uh, remove the uh, Guy, Arkansas, series of earthquakes and then we move further Raton Basin earthquake that's from um, southern Colorado, northern New Mexico and then you can see this curve kind of restore back to uh, more natural conditions and then we move all these uh, reported seis induced seismicities and we can uh, kind of again restore this uh, cumulative curve. And so um, from the two data set that we uh, find that uh, the association seems pretty clear. But again, um, association or coordination is not necessarily causation. And so we wanted to, to uh, examine the question of how and why, not whether. And so and then we can uh, look at the uh, physical mechanism. And that's when we started to look into how pool pressure changes when the uh, injected fluid goes to the subsurface. And uh, the basic theory that um, uh, we use is uh, poroelasticity. So poroelasticity has two parts. One is poroelasticity. So the poro is really related to water. Elasticity related to rock deformation. And so that's the, uh, the basis here. Uh, one of the earliest uh, poroelasticity phenomena was observed in 1892 uh, by Mr. King, he lived in uh, on a farm in Wisconsin, and um, he observed that phenomena, and then was reported in a USGS publication. And and so this uh, uh, Mr. King's farm was near a train station, and so what he observed is that uh, he has a, a groundwater well nearby uh, on his farm, and so the uh, what he observed is that when the train comes to this into the station, uh, the water level in the well increases. And when the train comes into, really goes into the station, and then the water level uh, reaches the maximum. As the train leaves the station, the water level recovers. And so that's the, uh, really probably the first observed poroelasticity phenomenon. And so what we um, can see here is that the water level fluctuation in a groundwater well really reflect the pool pressure change at the bottom of the well where the well is open or communicating with the aquifer here. So when the pressure here is high, water level goes up. When water pressure is lower, water table goes down. And so when the train comes to the station, applies stress onto this system, the stress um, and then tr translate into high pool pressure pushes water up. And so that reflects the uh, loading or rock and water physical interaction. And so that's um, poor elasticity is a coupling between changes in rock stress and changes in pull pressure. And as we um, seen in the uh, train illustration. And there is a set of equations that um, um, goes into poroelasticity that describe it. And we're not going to go into the details, but just point out that the one set of equations describes the rock deformation, uh, describes the stress part. And then the other part, second part of the equation um, talks about uh, pull pressure or describes the fluid uh, physics and looking at the pull pressure change 
And then uh, the third part of poro elasticity theory is just couple them together. And so in theory, we could uh, solve these equations, get the detailed description of what's the rock deformation, what's the stress, what's the pull pressure in the subsurface under various conditions. But uh, in, um, if we look at just the uh, description of the physical process, um, for elasticity again, there's a, a one way is looking at soil to fluid coupling, and that's what the, the choo-choo train example is, a change in applied stress from the train that produces a change in pull pressure. And, and then um, the other side of the poro elasticity is uh, fluid to solid coupling. And that's when there's a change in pull pressure that you can also produce a change in stress. And that's the um, wastewater injection due seismicity case where uh, when you're injecting fluid that causes pull pressure change and that would cause change in uh, stress. Um, the changing stress, if the changing stress is in an on fault, then you create earthquakes. And so that's uh, one part of the poro elasticity we can uh, look into to explain the physics. And so the bottom line of the poro elasticity is that we can uh, obtain pull pressure and stress deformation under a set of prescribed conditions, uh, whether that's the hydrological loading or mechanical loading. And, and also uh, the solution will depend on the rock properties, whether these rocks are weak or strong, uh, hydrological properties, whether these uh, rocks are highly trans, uh, permeable or not uh, permeable. So that's enough big equations. And if we look at the geological system, uh, most of the induced seismicity uh, occurs along faults. And so, so right now we're gonna uh, just focus on the fault situation and this is a, a generic description of the stress condition around a fault here. And, and so if you think about the, uh, these red arrows as just a background stress, um, at any point in the subsurface you have kind of background stress, whether it's from overburden or from lateral compressions. And so these background stress will translate uh, for this fault, as far as this fault sees, it sees two components. And that means that, that this background stress can translate into two sets of stress. One is a shear stress, one is a normal stress. So the shear stress basically uh, kind of promotes the fault motion. If the shear stress is large, then the fault moves. The normal stress kind of uh, inhibits the fault motion. And so that's uh, what it says here, shear stress tall, and then normal stress uh, multiplied by some kind of frictional coefficient that represents resistance. And so if we want to look at the fault, whether it's a stable or not, and we can just look at uh, uh, what's the stress on that fault, and that would be the difference between the shear and uh, resistance, and that's what we call the Coulomb stress. And so that's a little bit uh, simpler. And so basically, if the Coulomb stress on the fault is uh, large, or is this, uh, smaller than zero, uh, that means shear stress is small, frictional stress is large, then it's a stable situation. Um, if the two components are about the same, then uh, that's a critically stressed condition, and that means they're kind of, it's a stable, but any perturbation could cause it, uh, this thing to move. And, and then uh, the other situation is when the shear stress is large, uh, frictional resistance is small, then the fault will move. And so those are the three basic situations. Um, and so that's the uh, same equation that in, the, um, in here. Oops, sorry. And so the same equation here, and I'm gonna just look at the, the, the change of this uh, stress here. And so what uh, um, this uh, situation here is the change in Coulomb stress and then change in shear stress, and this is the change in frictional resistance. And I also added one term here is the uh, pull pressure term. And so now we're gonna, and so if we don't consider the pull pressure, if, we, if the rock is totally dry, if there's no pool water in the system, then we could uh, uh, use this uh, Coulomb stress criteria to describe the fault stability. But in, uh, most of the, uh, sub, or almost all the subsurface conditions, we have water in poor spaces, so we should not ignore pull pressure ex existence. And so the Coulomb stress criteria can be modified by this pull pressure existence here. And so uh, once you add this modification here, 
then uh, a few things that I want to note here. The pool pressure increase, if we change the pool pressure into, um, has a positive increase, that will always lead to a large Coulomb stress change. And again, if you recall the previous slides, when you have positive Coulomb stress change, then uh, fault tends to move. And, and the other a very important point here is that pool pressure is the variable that changes with time. And so if you look at the uh, background stress, whether it's shear stress or normal stress, under normal conditions, and the stress are more or less constant. They change through geological time, or maybe thousands of years, hundreds of years. But over a few years of time scale, tens of years scale, those stress do not change much. Uh, however, pull pressure, in particular, if there's an injection or extraction, and that is a very much a time-dependent variable here. So that is a, a critical factor here. Uh, pull pressure is a variable that changes with time in this whole kind of equation. And uh, we can calculate pull pressure or uh, figure out or estimate pull pressure from um, all these uh, different um, input parameters and variables. Um, so with that background, and I'd like to, uh, some of you what, what, uh, reviewed this experiment, and some of you may have seen this, and to further illustrate the, uh, why pull pressure here is a critical factor in the false, in false stability. And so this is an experiment, a beer can experiment uh, conducted in 1959 by Hubbard um, and Ruby. And so uh, this is just to show the uh, influence of pull pressure. This is a great experiment because it's an empty can, and so you get to uh, drink the beer first. And, and so you put this beer can upside down on a flat surface, and if you tilt this uh, flat surface, this beer can will slide, and that's when uh, that's, we're doing this in room temperature. And so when the beer can slide, that means the sh uh, shear stress, uh, shear is greater than the resistance, so the things move. Now if you, move, if you bring this kick, uh, beer can uh, to a freezer, uh, deep freezer and overnight, and then you bring it back the next day, and if you do the same experiment on this uh, same uh, flat surface, and what you would notice is that um, um, you only need to tilt very little and a uh, much smaller angle than what you did the previous day. And so the, the beer can will st start to slide. And so what this says here then, um, uh, or indicate is that the, when you bring this uh, very cold beer can to room temperature, the air inside the beer can is going to expand and so because of warmer temperature. When the, the air expands inside, it creates pressure against the wall, also create extra pressure against the flat surface here. And so there is extra pressure that's generated here. And this is what uh, Bill, uh, Hubbard and Ruby said that this is an analog to pull pressure in the geological conditions where you have uh, pull pressure between rock blocks. And so that's uh, pretty smart. And so that's um, uh, further support this uh, uh, term here. Okay, and uh, so the, the, the geologists at that time in the 1950s, uh, 50s and 60s really had a great time. They conduct a beer can experiment and they go to the field to do a real injection experiment. And so um, the, probably the, one of the most uh, well-known Indian science mystery case is in the Rocky Mountain Arsenal. And so, uh, again, some of you probably heard about this classic case that in, 19, uh, in, the, middle 19, in the middle 1960s, um, the um, Rocky Mountain Arsenal facility injected a lot of wastewater into the subsurface. And so this is the uh, earthquake occurrence uh, correspond, corresponding to the wastewater injection, and you can see very well correlation. And so at that time, um, and that again, that's the first time that it's been uh, very well documented. Um, and then a group of USGS scientists went to Western Colorado to conduct, uh, in the oil field, to conduct the ex injection experiment. At that time, there is some understanding about uh, the physics. And so they went to the uh, field. And uh, what they did is that they, uh, by manipulating the pull pressure, injection pressure, 
and then they monitor seismicity around uh, the ejection wells. And indeed, they uh, observe that uh, um, the seismicity or seismic events on and off following the manipulating of poor pressures and, and they're doing here. And so those are the uh, classic examples that I wanted to uh, review here. And that just to say that uh, some of the basic theories that uh, we know already for a long time, but yet uh, we're still talking about it today. And, um, and as basically say that we're not inventing any uh, uh, theories. But numerical modeling wise, and more detail taking into consideration of uh, complex geological factors, I think we are much more advanced today than uh, 50 years ago. And so with that, uh, those background, I'd like to uh, change now to a case study that we conducted in uh, central Oklahoma. And, um, and so here's a map of uh, Oklahoma um, carved out from uh, this map here. And, and we particularly we look at uh, a seismicity um, uh, events, a series of seismicity events in central Oklahoma, just northeast of uh, Oklahoma City. And um, this is a generic cross-section, geological cross-section. And there is that uh, Nimaha Fault that runs north-south, roughly north-south uh, across the state and um, near Oklahoma City. And uh, uh, there are act, uh, extraction and injection activities going on on both sides of the fault. And in particular, the Alba Cold Dolomite Formation here and on the east side is uh, particularly near uh, Nimaha Fault is relatively deep. And this is the uh, most of the deep well injection uh, wa uh, wastewater goes into this uh, formation. And so there's about uh, 300, uh, 3,500 feet deep. And so it's relatively deep well injection and it's a, uh, also relatively permeable formation. And ideally, you want some permeable formation to receive the fluid and so that uh, and you can receive relative large quantity. And one of the reasons that uh, Oklahoma has uh, a lot of wastewater is that uh, the, uh, the dewatering method they use for producing oil and gas. And, and so in the, um, some, the, the oil gas formation, the, uh, originally the oil gas is kind of tight in the tight formation. And so this is the, uh, the blue areas represent fractures and uh, porous spaces, but uh, oil gas are, uh, in the natural state, they're not uh, floating in these uh, cracks, but uh, rather they're locked in uh, pretty tight, small porous spaces. And so it's very difficult to extract them, uh, just let them flow out. And so the watering method is that you pump water from the, over the larger area. And so you, when you pump water from these cracks, you lower the pressure. And by pumping water out, and you lower the pressure, and then you promote the oil and gas and the uh, expansion that goes into these uh, lower pressure areas. And so that's when uh, oil gas particle uh, molecules that go into these cracks or large open pore spaces, and then um, then the mix with water, then pump things out. And now you can see that uh, when you pump things out, it's a quite a mixture of water, oil, and the gas. And, and that uh, relatively large uh, volume of water is produced from that kind of dewatering method. And so um, come back to uh, the map of Oklahoma again. Uh, these uh, dots are the seismicity locations and these uh, squares are the locations of the uh, injection wells. The size of these squares represent the, the rate of injection as uh, shown here. These are in terms uh, in unit of uh, bush barrels per month. And, and so here's Oklahoma City, and here's the Nimaha Fault, and uh, we're looking at uh, uh, the event around uh, this region, the Johns uh, event. And so we conducted the hydrogeology model and um, uh, conduct the three-dimensional model that uh, one side is the Nimaha Fault, and from Nimaha Fault goes to uh, extend to north east east and and this is a conceptualization of the numerical model and have uh, different lithological layers in the model that uh, correspond to different uh, hydrological properties um, they are two sets of uh, injection wells that we considered 
One is the high rate injection wells, uh, four of those, and, and then the other set is relatively low injection uh, rate, there are uh, 69 of those. And plotted here are the cumulative volume or injection volume versus time. The blue line is the cumulative volume from the set of lower rate injection wells. And so um, because it started early, so the cumulative volume is large. And the red line shows the cumulative volume from the set of high rate injection wells. It came online relatively late, and so the cumulative volume is smaller, uh, but the uh, injection rate is higher. Um, this is, well, jumping to the modeling result now, this is the pore pressure generated from these two sets of injection wells that uh, we put into the model. And this is a two time snapshot, uh, plan view, and here's the Nimaha fault. Uh, uh, the color shows the pore pressure uh, increase from injection and the scale bar shows the uh, from 0 0.01 to 1 megapascal and so around the injection high rate injection wells uh, we have we see the highest injection rate uh, highest pore pressure increasing and so from uh, 2009 to 2012 and the area of influence is greatly expanded um, and the black dots are the seismicity locations. The, uh, here is a vertical cross-section of the pore pressure situation and a cross-section goes from uh, about here. And, um, and this is the injection formation. And then we can see that uh, pore pressure propagates not, not limited in the uh, injection formation. It does propagate to the basement rock. And, and then here on the right is the um, histogram shows the seismicity occurrence versus depth. And, and so what we, um, from the seismicity data, we see that about 20% of the earthquakes occurred in the sedimentary layer or in the injection formation. And uh, most of the seismicity actually occurred uh, below the um, injection formation. That is uh, interesting. Uh, we also looked at, uh, um, at each of these uh, seismic locations, what is the pore pressure change at the time of the earthquake. And so this plot shows the number of earthquakes that occurs at uh, a certain pressure change. And, and so from uh, 0 to 0 0.5 megapascal, at about uh, 0 0.07 megapascal, and we do observe a large number of earthquakes occurred when the pore pressure change reaches this number. And that's for uh, this uh, particular um, situation that we modeled in Oklahoma. And uh, um, so we, we could consider that kind of critical pore pressure or threshold pore pressure, but I think that, that would be a quite uh, site dependent, and uh, not necessarily a unique number for um, induced seismicity. Um, and so the other thing we looked at is uh, uh, since we have two distinct set of wells and we want to see how these two set of wells contributed to uh, pool pressure generation. And so we looked at the pool pressure at this white star location. So this white star is sort of in the center of uh, many seismic events. So we can consider this as a center of the seismicity swarm, uh, um, that uh, uh, John's swarm. And so at this location, pore pressure change due to the uh, lower rate injection wells is shown in the dash line. And so this dash line, uh, the pore pressure change at this location generated by these lower rate injection wells. Um, this red line is the pore pressure change generated by the four high rate injection wells from here um, at this location. And then this blue line is a summation of these two curves. And so what we see here is that uh, um, at this location, these four high rate injection wells generated significantly higher pore pressure than uh, this set of lower rate injection wells. And, uh, and so that is an uh, interesting observation that or modeling results that um, um, we observe from here. Okay, 
And uh, so the high rate injection and jumped out from our modeling results. And then we went to, uh, we went back to the database and just to see the correlation whether the high rate injection well, where, uh, wells has a um, correlate um, more or better to the seismicity occurrence. So this is what uh, uh, we looked at, the, we went back to the database, look at all these wells injection rates and we also look at the, each of these wells cumulative volume. And, and so here the um, number of wells versus injection rate, the blue bars are all the wells in our uh, study database and the yellow bars are the uh, wells that are identified and being associated with earthquakes. And so if we divide the yellow by blue and then uh, it's a blue line here. And, and so what we see here is that below uh, 100,000 barrel per month and the association is, the chance of association is about 50-50 and so it's kind of random association. Um, but if the rate goes beyond, um, let's say 300,000 barrels per month, the association or um, the high rate wells are much more likely to be associated with the earthquake. And so that's a, a kind of consistent with the, the numerical modeling results. Uh, but on the other hand, the injection total, uh, cumulative injection volume that we really don't see a clear correlation um, as what we see for the injection rate. And, and then the final thing that we did is uh, um, just step further back, look at a very simple case of um, conceptual uh, experiment. And just to look at the case, two cases that has the same hydrological conditions, um, same total injection volumes V, and, but one case will inject at high rate and the other case will inject at the lower rate. And so this conceptual experiment means mathematical experiment that uh, we use uh, an analytical solution to calculate the pressure change given everything else is the same except the injection rate. And so here's a plot of pressure versus distance from the injection site. And, and here for uh, low, at early times here, for lower injection rate, poor pressure is lower. High injection rate, uh, poor pressure is higher. And, and then uh, as time progresses, poor pressure increases. And um, at one point, the high rate injection ex experiment will reach the total volume. And so this is the maximum case where the high rate injection reaches the maximum and it will stop now injecting and then through time it will recover, pull pressure will uh, reduce. Now in the lower rate injection case, because it's a lower rate, it has not reached its intended volume and so it continues to grow uh, pull pressure. And so this is at the end, both, situ uh, both case reaches the total volume and this is the end result of the pull pressure situation. So what do we learn from this? And if I draw a horizontal line here and then you will see that in the high rate injection experiment, the pull pressure experienced higher values in this red case. And this is the highest pull pressure for blue, uh, for lower rate injection wells and that's high, as high as it can go. But for the high rate, it, the uh, maximum pressure was higher um, at a certain time. And so this experiment showed that a high pore pressure is indeed experienced in the high rate injection case. And despite of the fact that pore pressure is lower um, at the end of the experiment uh, because it shut down earlier and then start to recover. So, um, so these are from different, several different angles that uh, we uh, kind of conclude or converge to the conclusion that high rate is really the, probably the culprit. And so come back to the uh, question we asked earlier, uh, why are some injection sites more prone to seismicity? Um, after a couple of years of um, study, uh, do we have an answer for this question? And I would say no. Um, but did we make progress um, in this area? And I would say yes. And so, um, and that's uh, to um, recap or summarize what uh, the progress is that we made in this area. 
And from database study that we find that the recent increase in seismicity is clearly associated with wastewater injection and that's just from database study. And also from database study, we find that a high rate injection will are more likely to be associated with earthquakes. And then uh, from numerical modeling uh, study and uh, the Oklahoma case, and we also suggest that a high rate injection um, is perhaps the major contributing factor for generating high pull pressure. And from there, and so this is a, a hydrological study and we mostly focus on pull pressure. And from here, and we can uh, infer that uh, high pull pressure reduce the uh, resistance of the fault. And then so if we plug this result back to the poro elasticity, and we can uh, perhaps suggest that uh, that a high rate injection well is a um, major contributing factor for induced seismicity. And, and so um, there are other factors that I, uh, or other things that we are continue to ponder in terms of operational, and we looked at the community rate, uh, community volume and injection rate. And uh, we did not talk about uh, injection, uh, injection pressure. And part of the reason is that uh, uh, injection pressure is a, a pretty difficult to obtain. Um, the data that are in the existing database, they, they are reported uh, the wellhead pressure. And so it's a pressure reported uh, uh, whether it's a meter reading from the, on the surface. And that is not the full pressure that we like to, uh, well, in terms of detailed study, uh, we really like to know the pressure at the depth and the formation pressure. And so it's uh, uh, quite tricky now to get the formation pressure, but I think uh, uh, progress is uh, being made in terms of obtaining um, in-situ uh, pull pressure at the uh, injection depth. And so those are the continuing work and um, other geological and hydrological factors and detailed stratigraphy and uh, also proximity to the basement. Um, uh, we find that uh, the lot of seismicity has occurred in the basement, and even though the injection is above the basement, and there are other numerical study have suggest that uh, if there is a barrier between the injection and uh, the basement rock, and the, the seismicity uh, occurrence may be reduced. And so these are uh, continuing study try to examine what kind of um, scenarios that may minimize or reduce the risk of seismicity. Faults is really the big factor uh, in probably all the cases because most of the earthquakes occur along faults. And uh, those are uh, the factors that afterwards that we know when we look at the seismicity locations and say, oh, here's a fault. Uh, but uh, those faults are not previously known. Most of them are not previous, uh, previously mapped. Uh, background stress, and there's also, um, I think, a quite a big effort in different parts of the uh, different institutions and in looking at the background uh, stress and also background pull pressure, rock properties uh, or fault property. So there are uh, many factors that we continue to um, look into. And so if we look at uh, our various uh, factors that uh, in this process, and we can probably should adopt a process based system approach to uh, better understand and managing induced seismicity. And I think that the seismicity is something that can be managed. And, and so operational factors, hydrological conditions and geological conditions, and perhaps we could find uh, some uh, sweet spot that uh, is prone to seismicity. And I don't think uh, there is a um, magic formula anywhere yet. And even for any particular state, I think uh, um, we don't have um, a set of things that we can follow that um, um, identify locations. And so a couple of things that I would like to uh, advocate here is that data, um, data open uh, access. And uh, from our experience, it was uh, quite uh, difficult and uh, complex to obtain data, injection data, or well, seismicity data is relatively easy. And it's, I think it's mostly injection data. And every state is different, and uh, um, we would like to see some kind of uniform protocol um, across the country. 
and uh, um, so that would make uh, I think research much easier and that will benefit everybody hopefully industry uh, communities and research community and monitoring also I think uh, seismicity monitoring um, is quite different from hydrological monitoring there is a, a quite a significant lack in pool pressure modeling and because it is difficult you need wells and that's expensive to drill and but we can probably use abandoned wells and uh, other approaches to be more creative that generate more pool pressure data that's uh, lacking. Uh, modeling is something that's uh, uh, easy to do and in particular I think before um, more proactive approach it would be conduct modeling before injection uh, rather than uh, reactive and I think that's what mostly what we're doing now when there's a earthquake we shut down wells um, not much really before um, operation studies and so those are the things that um, I think we should all advocate and uh, um, um, I finally I'd like to acknowledge the uh, people who contributed to this study um, Matthew Wingarden was a PhD student worked with me uh, for four years and uh, um, he's now at Stanford University postdoc and Katie Crennan uh, and uh, Jeff, Jeff Abers from Cornell University contributed to the uh, Oklahoma case study and, and then um, a group of working group uh, su supported by US Power Center, USGS Power Center and that uh, particularly look at uh, injection induced seismicity and um, that was co-led by uh, four people here, Barbara Beacons, Art McGar, John, Jonathan God, and myself. And, um, and so everybody, so this is a group of hydrogeologists and uh, geophysicists and social scientists that uh, all contributed to uh, part of this study. So I'm going to leave this here and conclude my talk. And um, thank you for your attention. And I'd be happy to entertain any questions you may have right on time. Um, so the question is whether these earthquakes damaged wells. I do not think so. So this earthquake, most of the earthquakes are pretty small. In Oklahoma, they have been three uh, earthquakes that's greater than five. That's considered large. And um, they, some did cause damage on surface structures, uh, houses, and uh, uh, chimneys, and um, different structures, but not uh, wells that I'm aware of. Um, some of those, most of the earthquakes, they're not immediately around the wells. They're a little bit further, uh, deeper. So. Yes. So I'm curious, the earthquake mechanisms for all these earthquakes that are associated with um, injection of wells, like temporally and spatially, is there some common mechanism, or is the mechanism basically representative um, so, the, so the question is about uh, earthquake mechanism, whether there's a common mechanism. I'm not aware of a common mechanism of all the induced seismicity. Uh, I'm not a, a seismologist, I'm a hydrogeologist. But I think uh, uh, what you hinted about the regional stress, I, I would just uh, probably concur with you that because Again, they, all the seismicity come along the existing, most of it along existing faults. And so these existing faults have something to do with the original, most of it have some regional stress. So I would think that's probably consistent with whatever the background regional stress is. Um, that said, um, but go back to the question that I do not know whether there is a consistent pattern for induced seismicity. Yes. Go. Go ahead. Uh, a question that I get frequently um, in our region of the Wilson Basin is in the level of the North East Montana and Western North Dakota. <clears throat> They've done a tremendous amount of uh, wastewater injection. I don't know volumes, but it's significant. And yet we have a few um, induced earthquakes. And um, my answer, I don't know if I'm 
Yeah, it does. And so the Dakota Formation, it's also relatively permeable. And um, the other thing I would, I guess, because of our study, our experience, I would also look at the, the, uh, the rate. They've been injecting for a long period of time. The rate is probably not extremely high. So the case that we looked at, uh, the, the Oklahoma case, um, it's 300,000 barrels per month over a very short period of time. And so that's, that is a pretty high rate compared with other injection modes that we have seen. I don't remember the uh, willison based injection rate, but I think it's in general is lower. Um, I, I would also agree with you that uh, um, in, in that uh, the code formation compared with the bedrock, the fault distribution perhaps is not as bad as in the uh, um, bedrock basement rock. Um, the geological conditions, you're saying the geological conditions perhaps Played a role. Yeah, so this is one. Um, um, so that goes back to the original question why some places are prone to seismicity, some places are not. And that was clear. In, we knew that there are some places that just don't have seismicity, but we have not looked into the details. I think a geological condition could be one reason, but, uh, but again, I think the injection rate could contribute to that as well. Yes? I think they do have vested interest, but I don't know what kind of research they do. Uh, we do not have, we don't have communications with them. Uh, we obtain data from the state, and they um, they only report the data they have to report, and we would not have that. Uh, Charm to get data from them. Like data more data. That would depend on right. how the state yeah, regulate them. Um, yes. So I mean, if I am industry, I I would think that I, I would probably report the minimum amount of data I can. But I also would have best interest to um, like do it minimize whatever the impact, because there are litigations going on, and it's not an ideal situation if those quick happens. And yes? Now you will introduce the main impact of the magnitude or the aspect is to power pressure increase, so that we can increase the building stress. Yeah. So the question is that uh, the uh, pull pressure. So in here, we are basically talking about pull pressure reduce the effective stress. Um, but the question is whether pull pressure can reduce the frictional coefficient, and they sort of have the same effect. Um, I don't know. I would think that could. Possibly, so you're basically looking at how pull pressure change the rock properties. And that's the question, whether uh, could change the rock properties so that the rock become softer, more uh, a smaller fric uh, friction coefficient. That's what you suggest. Um, that's possible, but I, I, uh, our study, we didn't change, uh, yeah, we didn't do that. I think that could be, well, that's probably best investigated in the lab. Uh, numerical modeling would not be the best way to do it, but I think in the lab we probably could measure that. That's a definite possibility. Although I would say that the change, or well, typically the uh, frictional coefficient does not change by magnitude, uh, or order of magnitude. It may reduce by half. And so typically you have 0 0.6 and maybe you have 0 0.4 or 5. So the, the amount would be small. But it's an interesting question. Okay. 